All right, welcome everybody. We are here with uh, one of my favorite people and a great role model, and that's Jeff Stewart from Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, Jeff, rather than me telling your story, what I would really like for us to do is for you to kind of walk us through the evolution of your real estate career, when you started in real estate, as a starting point, why you got in the business, how your first year turned out, how you launched your career, and then ultimately we'll get to where you are today. So tell us your story. And uh, if you will, share, share kind of those, uh, those early days. Um, I just want to say, just to kind of keep everybody really interested in this, that today I believe that you are one of the most exemplary role models of real estate agents who have a real estate practice, who have learned to succeed through other people. And um, that, that journey of, you know, building a team where you're the visionary yep. and, and, and you set the table and put the right people at the table and then work with them so that you succeed through them. That's really rare. And so, where this conversation will go kind of as it evolves is that it will become a conversation um, about leverage, building a dominant listing base and why that's so important. And I think there's going to be a lot of tidbits that are really juicy about how to lead. And so I'm, I'm really, really, really super excited you're here and let's, let's have some fun. Tell us about when you got in real estate and give us that whole story. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate you having me here, Mark. So real estate for me was interesting because it w there was no destination. I've, I've heard your story and your vision right out of the gates. And I, I, I admire that focus and that drive. And, and for me, it, it, real estate was more environmental for me. So there was, I, I had quite a few failures. Was when, I, when people say, tell me your story, I think they're looking for the nuggets, but it, it was actually the times I got knocked down that defined and engineered me, really was the architect of how I launched and what, what got going. Um, for me, the, like it all culminated, a lot of big disappointments. I, I said failures, just opportunities to get better. Um, I, it was 2008. Um, it's, it comes down to one moment. I'm sitting in my living room and I'm watching like the world be decimated. I mean, I'm watching the stock market fall apart and I'm sitting in my living room. I've, I've been in the cycling industry. I've engineered a break that ended up being in the Tour de France, like rock the industry. I built an e-commerce site from the ground up. It was three or four in the country on e-commerce sites in the cycling industry. And then I'm sitting there and I'm watching the stock market crashed. And I had this, uh, I don't want to call it epiphany, but just this settling where I realized that the woman that was sitting behind me on the bed, I, I couldn't create the environment that she deserved with what was around me. Mm. And that's a humbling experience. I mean, when, when you feel you have all these things that are going right. And then I, I looked and I was watching the environment fall apart financially. And I just said, internally, I, 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 I don't have, I can't give her what, what I think she deserves. So I'm about your wife, Leah. I am. Yeah. 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 And I, I always say I walked into Leah's room, which is funny because believe it or not, we shared a room. We've been married for about a year and I, I walk back into her room and I say, uh, I have a crazy idea. And she said, what? Cause she's used to crazy ideas. I chase rainbows and unicorns for a living. Right. So she, oh, yeah. she's like, what? And I said, I, the, the market's falling apart. And I, I believe everybody's going to bail out of the industry and I want to move to Asheville. We were in Georgia at the time. I said, I want to move to Asheville and learn as the market rises, I'll get better and better and build a business. And I, I get chills every time I say it because she, she didn't ask a single question. She yeah. looked me dead in the eyes and she said, I trust you. Oh, wow. And that's that was the foundation that gave me the courage to go to Asheville and sleep on a couch for two years in my buddy's house where he didn't have room for me. Two years on a couch with your wife in Georgia. Yep. Yeah. Yep. What a great story. And so talk about um, how you launched. 
Well, it was painful. It was painful. I, I, I mentioned accelerators a lot in, in my life, but it takes key accelerators in your life, people to step into your life and then actually give you momentum, like spin that merry-go-round and get you to that, that momentum you need to move to the next level. And what, what I found was this gentleman, Rory, I'm sleeping on his couch. I failed twice. I ran out of money and packed the car. And he came and he pulled me back and, and said, I, I believe in you. And he gave me some, a, a loan and the confidence to keep pushing forward. And so from that day on, it, it was a struggle until, or from that time on, it was a struggle until I finally started, uh, I, I don't know if you've read The Wealthy Gardener, but we, we water the garden. The watering of the garden is the activities. It's the lead generation. It's, it's treating it like a business from day one. And I watered that garden more than anybody I knew. I was the first car in the parking lot. I was working 15 hours a day and no success. And, and literally it's for how long, for how long, no success. So I, I, I'm going to be really vulnerable with you. When, when I, when I quit, I quit real estate twice and Rory came and got me out of my car. It was packed to go back to Georgia to tell my wife I failed. When she looked at me and said, I trust you. I was going back to tell her I failed. She didn't know about the money. She didn't know I was living on a credit card. We didn't have any money. I had $336 when I went to Asheville. I remember that number because it was terrifying. <laughs> and I did that for uh, the second time he gave me a loan. He said, I don't care when you pay me back. And I got uh, within four months of that, that was in the fall. Well, five months and in February of that next year, I had, I had paid him back and was putting money in the bank. But that was about, about a year, a year in, year and a half. So your first year in the industry, Mm -hmm. What kind of commission income did you earn? <laughs> well, I spent $45,000 on a credit card. Okay. Tell me what you did with that $45,000. Well, I made $32,000 in commission. Out of that $45,000 that I spent, I was, uh, I really was connecting with clients. I was doing lots of lunches. I was doing no paid ad service. And I put 65,000 miles on my car in the first year. Wow. If you mentioned real estate, I was at your house trying to find a win for you. So 32,000 the first year. 32 grand. Yep. And how did like your first year in the industry, how did you approach selling real estate? I, I heard you saying that you work 15 hours a day. You were the first one there. You were any conversation about real estate. You were all over it. Like, how did you approach this? This is this is really funny because I know you're gonna, this is going to resonate with you. But I I have always been told my whole life I'm a great salesman. So I came into real estate as a salesman. Uh, so I plowed, just went as hard uh, as I could, and I sold. And selling isn't the answer. No, of course not. Nobody wants to be sold anything. Nope. People want to be seen. Yep. They want to be heard. And they want to be understood. They want to know you care. That's right. They want to know they can trust you. That's right. And they want to have a pretty good sense that you can help them, right? Help them grow. I mean, that, that you can provide meaningful help to them. So really, the only way to sell is to serve. That's right. So I call it consulting now. So when I'm developing... Uh, opportunities for agents around me, we go into the first question I ask them is I said, I guarantee someone told you you're great at sales. You're going to do great. Right. And they always say, yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I've always been a good salesman. I said, good. Let's move to consulting. Let's gather I'm information. I'm a good salesman, Jeff. I, I just wouldn't have built the lifestyle I did if it was all about selling. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's the bottom line. There's a limited return to what you can get from selling. Okay. So let, let's just kind of fast forward your second year. What'd you earn? Second year. So my goal was to make $60,000. I made $59,000. Nice. Maybe mm -hmm. um, third year. My goal was to make $100,000. I made $99,900. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's still painful. <laughs> so maybe you weren't thinking big enough. I don't know. Okay, so um, and let's uh, let's talk about where your business is today, and 
you know, of course, we're fast forwarding from 2008, 2009. By the way, and I just want to say for all our listeners that 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, brutal years in the industry. I mean, just brutal because all the subprime money got ripped out of the market. Anybody could get a loan in 2007 and then 2008, all those loans, people were overextended and bam, everything crashed. And we had huge brokerage houses that were folding right and left. And uh, I mean, it was a crisis. We had, we had a whole stimulus plan that then President Bush put out. Uh, it was all about you know, restarting the economy. And so you did get in at the worst possible time. And yet that's, that's probably when the greatest opportunity really shows up is when things aren't good right? and, and you show up and you work and you act as though things can be good. That's right. That's right. So it's mindset and activities. Right. right. Okay. So now let's talk about where you are today. That's great. So where I am today is I, uh, in the Keller Williams model, we have something called a team leader. It acts like a, a CEO. We run, the, we run the businesses. Um, I do, I play that role. I'm, I'm also an OP, which is an operating partner, which is uh, sets the vision and protects the investors money in the market center. On, in addition to that, I still have my real estate team and the real estate team flutters between number one and number two in the market. Um, and has an amazing brand, uh, brand equity and brand consistency with it that uh, we have an incredible client base with that. Yeah, I would, I would love to get uh, some copies of some of your marketing, just to do that. Yeah. provide a, a link so that people can see all that because it's, it's, it's exceptional. I've seen some of your marketing and I love it. Um, so in Asheville, uh -huh. You are the team leader of the Keller Williams Asheville Market Center that has how many agents? That's right. We've got 460, 62, 63. Yeah. So close to 500 agents yeah. in, in, in one office, one franchise. That's right. Um, where was that office when you started? <laughs> so that, that, uh, that office was at about 400 agents. They had just, um, we had incubated and launched a business center a year before, and we had done that with some surrounding um, market centers as well. Uh, so yeah, we fluttered in between the 375 and 400 mark prior to me coming on board. And now you're at 470 basically. Yep. And, and that's in a stretch of what, six years? Uh, three and a half. Three and a half years, okay, yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and your team that's number one or two in the market, uh -huh. um, going back and forth, but definitely one of the top brokerage teams in, in Asheville, North Carolina. Absolutely. Um, what, what would be the gross commission income that you guys saw last year, more or less? Uh, it's 1.67, more or less. <laughs> okay. All right. So congratulations. Thank you for that. 1.7 million. Okay, yeah. so now uh, when we talk team, mm -hmm. we're now talking about it's no longer you succeeding through you. No. It is about succeeding through other people, and that's, that's highly complex. I mean, uh, here's the way I like to look at it. You know, Kiyosaki has that, that cash flow quadrant. He yeah. says, okay, you're an employee. Rules are simple. You have a job description. You have hours that you work, you have areas of accountability, you check in with your boss, you do what you're supposed to do, you get a paycheck. That's right. Show up, do what you're supposed to do, you get a paycheck. Then self-employed. Now you're in business for yourself. No one else, but it's you. Okay? We, we all know this, but self-employed, the rules are more complex than they are being an employee. That's right. Uh, because you got to manage yourself and the hardest person to lead is yourself. We judge others by their actions. We judge ourselves by our intentions. And um, it's, it's, it's different um, being self-employed in terms of all the freedom, flexibility, everything else, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. More complex. Then you move to owning a business. Yes. A business is we're doing it together. Uh, ultimately, maybe they're doing it. And all I'm doing is providing vision and accountability and capital right. um, for that business. Uh, but they're doing it. Now, um, that's really complex. 
because now you've got to take everything in your head and you got to put it into the hearts and minds of the people you're succeeding through what your mission is, what the map looks like, where you're going, how you're going to get there, how long it's going to take to get there, what everybody's role is. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the way it works. So it's complex and it requires a calculated, non-reactive patience and vision. You're not patient, neither am I. So that makes it really complex. So let's talk about that journey from you being a self-employed agent mm -hmm. who eventually really began to nail it in Asheville. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really simple. And, and what's funny is because it is complex in the execution, it's simple in the concept. So when we talk about how that's done, it's done on a one-to-one -one basis. So the, the people that I am in business with, I know, I know who they are and they know I care and they know I'm there. I can be trusted. I can help them grow. And when I say grow, that's not, there's no ego in that. Grow means opportunity. Grow means open doors. It's up to them to swing the hammers and to walk through the doors, but they know for a fact that their bubble will never touch my bubble. And, and that's where we, so many of the, uh, like our coworkers and people that we talk about leverage with, they're leveraging the, the things they don't want to do rather than leveraging the things that can be leveraged that can provide opportunity. So for me, it's, I, I look at an org chart and I see these really tall org charts where people build them out and they, they're at the top. What, and when I say ego, I don't mean it negatively, but there is ego in here's my org chart da, 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 and it looks like a Christmas tree. And I have a belief that if I can flatten that org chart, if I can make it wider and not as deep, a flatter org chart represents opportunity. Because what I'm doing is rather than, rather than like, hey, who's going to jump up and be popcorn and get anointed? What I'm doing is I'm actually stepping down into it with them. And that is opportunity across the board. Mm hmm so it's, it's almost like I think of Stephen Jobs' circular org yeah. chart. You know, it, it's, it's maybe not even flat. No. It's, it's a circle, but there's no hierarchy. No, and no. I think that's what you're saying. No hierarchy. And, and what most people think is that, oh, I, you know, I'm the boss. It's, so, th so I love that. I'm the boss. It's my business. It's yeah. mine. This, it's my name on the business. That's right. And uh, that, that's a huge obstacle to succeeding to other people, right? They got to feel like it's our business. That's right. So if, if I can just speak to that real quickly. So, so the, we build businesses. We are good at business because I, there's an I am. I am good at business. I am a great real estate agent. I am the I. If you can take the I out of it. And I know that sounds like rainbows and unicorns, but when you are in a conversation and at an intrinsic level, at like the cellular level, every conversation you have with the people on your leadership team is about we and us. Mm -hmm. There's only one time you say I. My, the way I look at this is there's literally one time that you say I, and that's when you look somebody dead in the eye and you say, I won't let you fail on this. I know where we're going. Follow me. That's the only time you use the word I. Every other conversation is about us and we. How about you? Ah, that's good. That's good. You don't mean you, me. No, 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 no. no. I don't mean right. you, me. I, this is what I remember from, you know, my days is of working with Gary Keller. And, it, you know, I learned so much from Gary. And he's, he's, he's a visionary. He's a great thinker. And, yeah. you know, I'm a Pied Piper and I, I love people and, I just like, yeah. I, I like helping people raise up in life. That, that, that just makes, makes me kind of get excited. Uh, Gary would always talk to me and he'd say, you know, your technology platform needs to do this. Yep. Your company is yep. looking at you for this. Mm-hmm. You're, and it would be even stuff he was working on and he was accountable for it, but it was mine. That's right. Ownership. Then made me take ownership. I'm like, oh yeah, that's mine. 
yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Yeah. And um, I know that it was always really powerful language for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it made me feel 100% accountable for the outcome. It made me own it. It's there's there's a we, we all know this because we were raised in a hierarchical understanding of how business works. So the biggest challenge I run into is when we bring people into my organizations. And I said my because when I bring people in, I have ownership in creating an environment around them. That is an I statement. Yeah. So when when I bring people into my organizations, my like literally my commitment to them is to help them grow. It is to help them grow and to let them see opportunities. And I will not let them come to me traditionally and say, is this okay? What, like, I was going to do this, but I just wanted you to check off on it. Then we go into an explorative conversation about what would you do? Because every time they have to come to me, I become the guy that's the stopper in the pipeline. If you look at the funnel, I'm only as good as my ability to answer questions. So I'm teaching them like, hey, make the decisions. You're in that seat to make that decision. There's no mistakes. We can learn from opportunities, but there's no mistakes. I know that sounds like dreamy, but they stop asking you and the whole company lifts up. It's brick by brick. Well, you know, the thing that I I hear in this is that when people have permission to fail, mistakes, they feel safe. When people have permission to talk about the things that are their obstacles, and it's okay. Yeah. When people have permission to say, oh, I should have done it. I didn't do it. And you can have a conversation about why, yeah. how they feel about that mm-hmm. and where they're going with that. It opens up a whole different kind of dialogue and safety for those people who now feel like, okay, I can be comfortable being human here. That's right. And none of us are perfect. And yet in business, I find that most of us uh, left to kind of the, the hierarchical mm-hmm. that world of business that we were taught That's and, right. and the world lived for so long. We think we have to be perfect. Yep. And, and that doesn't work. <laughs> it just does not work. No. Now, and, and the other thing I love is that you said, I know these guys. You know, I had uh, yesterday, I had this amazing podcast with Erica Hill. Oh, yeah. And Erica is one of my leadership leverage, like heartthrobs of all heartthrobs. And uh, she said, you know, if you're in my world, I know you. Yep. I know about you. I know about your dreams. I know about your fears. I know your children. I know your pets. That's right. And I'm going to help you get where you want to go. And I'm just going to sit back and do everything I can to support you getting where you want to go. That's right. And, you know, the the dichotomy here is that a lot of people think, okay, I got a team. They work for me. And we touched on this earlier. They work for me. This is my business. I'm the one who has the risk here. I'm the one who um, has the reputation that has to be preserved, upheld. Yep. And in the end, it's everything. The buck stops here. <laughs> it's true. I hate that right. language. The buck has to stop there. But, you know, people don't like that language. People, people get repelled by that language. In fact, um, I think that the way we show up even in terms of our intentions mm-hmm. for eating, how we feel about a person, even when we behave as though everything is, is, is positive and good, but we're feeling like they aren't or something underneath that we're not really communicating. They feel it. They feel it hundred percent. So we transmit who we are, right? Well, Mark, the, and, and I, you're going to push back on this because it's your style, but the, what you do and, the, and, and what people say about you is a great example. So there's not a person I know that won't say, Mark knows everybody's ABA he ever met. That's true. Every person I ever talked to says, gosh, isn't that crazy? You know, and, and what they mean is he knows everybody he ever met. 
And, and, and that is that relationship. That's the foundation to earn the right to have a business conversation. If you don't know me and you're asking me about my numbers, it's probably not about that. It's where was I not clear on the numbers? If we missed the number, did I not communicate expectations correctly? Or did I not create an environment to allow you to succeed? Those, those are the questions. But you can't do that until you earn the right to get into that conversation. I, that's just so true. You know, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for saying that. And I love people and I want to know people. But I think it all starts with self-leadership, right? It does. And, if we're going to lead ourselves effectively, we have to be self-aware yep. first. We have to know what matters to us. We have to know where we're going and why. We have to know who you who we are in general. We have to have real clarity about how we contribute our genius to the world. Yep. But then beyond that, we have to understand our behavior, our traps, our strengths, our weaknesses, uh, who, who we are in terms of like, you and I, both low threes on the AVA. Right. We're reactive, variety chasing, diversity seeking, creative <laughs> thinking, urgent moving, you know, yeah. speed demons who are really impatient. And I always say a little twitchy. Yeah, twitchy. <laughs> twitchy. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's why I think behavior is so important. And when you mentioned AVA, that's, that's your behavioral profile, right? And so now if I know the behavior of who I'm leading, if I know what matters to them, if I know what their personal values and beliefs are, I can help them. You can. That's it. The help. If I don't know that, I can't help them. That's right. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. I love it. I love it. It requires, a lot of, it requires some therapy every now and then or, uh, or a good mentor or someone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, so for me, I, I, just to be transparent with, with you, I, I, I was raised in an environment to succeed in business. You had to actually diminish or dilute the personal connections like that. that and, and that was never said. But what I saw was like to achieve in business, these are the steps that you have to do. So, so we're, we're conditioned. I, ben Kenny said something the other day on a, on a call where he said, you're, your mindset is the, is the bucket. The shape of the bucket is determined by your, your mindset. And then the water fills the bucket into that shape. And, and that really resonated with me. If, if, if you believe, uh, well, that's just, it's a belief that I, I, I had. I love that analogy. I love oh. that analogy. It rocked me because it takes the shape of the bucket, right? Your life will take the shape of the bucket. And I, for me, it, it like it, it, those kind of things set me free when I know, and I, you, you are a great example of a leader that would, would dig in like that. And, and to say you can succeed at the highest level and have huge dreams and achieve really great things, but it starts on the personal level. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about, um, who, you know, lots of different languages used. We've heard, you know, wealth determiners, mm -hmm. Gary, Keller talks about empire builders um, yeah. and um, you know, what he says is that the truth of the matter is, is that when you have an empire builder, they determine the size of your empire, right? <laughs> That's right. And yet the dichotomy here is that they don't determine it by helping you get what you want. Mm -mm. They determine it by you helping them get what they want. That's right. And that's, uh, for me, that's, that's been such an empowering thing. I know that I had uh, five empire builders and my goal was every single one had to net over a million dollars a year. Yep. That's my criteria. Yep. And because they all wanted a lot. They all wanted a big life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another piece of like why it's so important that we know our people. And um, the, the, thing, the thing is, is that uh, when we talk about who those empire builders are, our business grows in direct proportion to the strength of the players in those key positions. That's right. So let's like, talk to me about who are your four or five key empire builders? 
And so, you don't have to use names, but what are the rules? I, I will because the, these are real relationships. So for me, and, and one of these is interesting because she's no longer with me, but she's still an empire builder for me. And her, her name's Allison. And she was the first, uh, the first true admin that we brought on um, with my team. And when she came, she came in as an admin and she became an empire builder within a year. So when we talk about technical skills and like leveraging the things we don't want to do, that was the premise that she came in. She was unemployed, living in her parents' basement when I interviewed her. And we did an interview in a car because I was so darn busy. I literally didn't have a second. She, she was worried to death. I said, get in my car. We're going to do the interview in the car. <laughs> but she, she literally taught me, it, well, it was the realization that people do things much better than I do. Mm. and that she continued to grow in that capacity and into operational management and setting standards for the team and help me communicate vision. And, and those, that's what, what you're talking about is the, the people on your hip that, you know, I'm shoulder to shoulder with these people and we can conquer the world. And, and she was a, a big, a big force in allowing me to understand leverage and appreciate it. And then also move toward these really, amazing uh, accomplishments for us or markers of achievement. Yeah. It's a, you know, the thing is, is that the minute that person shows up in your world, everything yeah. changes. Like it's, it's like you move from a dark night into yeah. early dawn right. and, and you begin to see clues of mm -hmm. how important the right hire is. I, I want to add something there. So I hear all the time, how do you find a great admin and how do you train them? And I think you'll know this to be true, but when that, when that person comes into your life, you do nothing except I, show up for them. Except what? Show up for them. You yeah. just, you, you just show up for them. hundred percent. You know, uh, was it Jim Collins and good to great? Yeah. He said it's first two, then what? Yeah, it is. It's not first what, then who. And I know the we, we spend so much time, and I'm guilty of this, figuring out what the what is. Yep. When the what is irrelevant, mm -hmm. because it's about who is doing the what. That's and right. Get the right person on the bus. And our ego minds, mm -hmm. like, oh, we got to do this. Nobody right. else can do this. <laughs> uh, oh, this is about me. Mm -hmm. I've got to spend this. I've got to create this. Not right. So, so, so there are, so when we talk about business and I don't, I don't mean to divert off that, but when we talk about business, a lot of the things that we're trying to, to replicate are how do I do this? How do, how do I do this? How do I find somebody to do this like me? And, the, and at the end of the day, what you're looking for is someone to, to actually do it better than you. You bring them into your world and then they actually allow you to step out of that well, I won't even say allow, they push you out of it. Force you. I got this. Yeah. And you're going to disempower them by staying in because they actually are better and they're serving your group as a, at a higher level with you out of the way. Right. 100%. Yep. So, um, Alice. Allison. Yep. Allison, still a, a huge empire builder, influencer in your business. So she's not she's not in my business anymore, but we're great friends. Uh, she she moved to another area, and uh, we talked today. Like she she's awesome, and I support her and her trajectory. She often checks and balances with me. She she knows me, right? And she continues to be that person. Um, in in my business world, on my team, because I have I have the different hats that I wear. But in my team, I think the the hardest thing to leverage out. And I'm gonna go to real estate agent talk here, but is the last thing you should leverage is your listings. So if you don't have a person that can show up on at the listing level above where you show up at or above where you show up, you, you can't get out of it. Yeah. So let's, let's kind of prioritize that whole concept of leverage yeah. and succeeding through others and putting the right people in the key spots. Yeah. First, first is admin. A hundred percent. Like get the low dollar productive activities Yep. Off your plate. Yep. 24 to 26 units. Yeah. It, and that, that, that's about the right range. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because you can lead with revenue a little bit. I probably would do it faster. So, yeah, because you know. I and, and actually did do it faster. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that you see people that go up to 45, 50 agent, 45, 50 transactions, and right. they, they don't have admin, and they are unhappy because they can't so, be so, And why? It, 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 I mean, for all the obvious reasons, right? I mean, it's like you got the money, but you got no life. And no. Um, so then when you show up, you're stressed, you're overworked, you can't be present in the moment for the person that you're serving. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've seen that over and over again. And then it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I need some relief, but people never meet my standards. I don't have time to train them. Like they can't do it as good as me. Like all the stories that we tell ourselves. I'm so much better. That's right. <laughs> I, I want to, I'm, I'm going to throw one thing in here. So, I, I, so that we have defining moments in our lives. And when we're talking about like, I, 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 when I was building my real estate business, I ended up having my first son named Jackson and I was driving somewhere after work or maybe it was on a Saturday and we have a Jeep Wrangler had one at the time and he was in the back. It was just he and I in the car and I was winning in real estate, winning number one in the MLS. Like I'm, I mean, I was winning, like crushing it. And I, I, one voice out of the back of the car, and this is from like a three, three year old, three, four year old. And he, and he says, Hey Papa. And I, yeah, buddy, what's up? Cause you, you don't know what's going to come out of the little minds. Right. Right. And he says, do you think that maybe someday you could not work so much and we could just ride bikes? Wow. I crashed the car. <laughs> like tears. Cause I was so wound in meeting the goals that I thought I needed to achieve that I had lost focus of what was most important. Right. That was about me. That wasn't about my son and my family. And it, it shifted my entire real estate career. Yeah. We all have those moments where our kids say something to us that you go, oh, crap. ouch, ouch. Yeah. Uh, I get that. And so that's a, that's a defining moment. That's a wake up call. Yeah. Um, so now it's about leverage. Mm -hmm. yeah. and you hire Allison, admin. Yep. What do you like when you look at leverage? And by the way, you know, you can think of an admin as an empire protector, like, yep. You know, we've heard Gary Keller say that, that an admin is an empire protector. But, but truthfully, uh, initially, an admin is almost an empire builder, right? Yeah, I mean, on, on, on the, if you get the right person. That's right. And, yeah. you know, it, and then just hiring right is not enough. Mm -hmm. but let's, let's keep going. So then after you have, have gotten the right person on the bus or in, their, in, their mm -hmm. administra in the administrative role, Yep. What's the next piece that you begin to leverage? So, so for me, my, my driving force behind leverage, as I believe it should be with everybody that gets into a leverage conversation, is how do I not penalize my clients for my success? Mm. So if, if my standards are being compromised and not enhanced or developed, those relationships with the client on a one-to-one -one basis – that's a result of me. And that's, that's not fair. And that's not, I'm not in integrity and I don't want to be in that relationship. So that's where leverage, that's why it's so important to me. So I will make sure that I accelerate with every hire. So I start with admin. Mm -hmm. the, the next person that you're going to bring on is typically another admin. Because you, the first one is to remove the pain. The second one is your accelerator. Second one is to systematize and transactionalize and yeah. That's, and that's the magic because that's when you feel it. Like, ugh. That's the when you feel it. Off. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Yep. Um, and then uh, obviously you, you go right to uh, partnering with an agent in some capacity. So how can somebody replicate some of the steps in our agent relationship in the business? And is that focused on just buyers yeah. on? Yeah. yeah. 
So then it is, okay, we've got all these buyer leads. That's right. And you're going to work with buyers. I'm going to focus on being the dominant listing agent. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you're going to pick up all those leads yep. and make a lot of money doing that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. So the, the listings is, is the last thing we hand, we hand off. Now in my world, I went to, I've, I've tried it all. I've failed at them all. So uh, I tried hiring quite a few buyer's agents. And then what I found was that I could build bigger lives for fewer agents. So that's an ego thing, right? When we're like, oh, I got plenty of leads. Come on. And you start bringing people onto the boat. But, yeah. I want to back up for a second because I think a lot of times that we think when we hire people that maybe we will work less. <laughs> and it's not so that you're working less. It's so that you are more productive. That's right. Generating more opportunity for now the people that surround you. And, and that, that mindset, like say you're hiring for relief. Yep. That means I'm going to work less. That's, that's that things I don't want to do. Right. Right. That, that, that's going to take a lot of stuff off my plate. Yep. And yet Jackson would still say, there's a lot of my daddy's plate. Yeah. He would. Off Papa's plate. Yep. He knows he does it. He, he knows you're productive. That's right. It's not to work less. No. No. It's more opportunity. It, it literally is about opportunity. And I, as the, people look at you like you're an alien when you talk about opportunity. My, my purpose, you know, I'm, I'm here to create a ripple effect and create a wake and a vacuum that people can slip into and, and move faster and more efficiently toward things that they maybe wouldn't have felt before. They look at you like you're an alien. Oh, yeah. But if you live in that space, like no one would like people are drawn towards success and momentum. So lean in, get that leverage, make your client experience much, much better because the, every client is going to keep accelerating. So for the, for the real estate agents who are solo practitioners who are listening, mm -hmm. really their job is building success, momentum and market share. How? With, with that. And, 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 it's, it's doing all the jobs until you can hire an admin yep. and a transaction coordinator, somebody who systematizes and communicates with your mm -hmm. clients. Um, but, you know, the whole job of the agent is to create success and momentum. And yet, what do we know about real estate agents? Yep. Oh, yeah. It's like... Um, that, that momentum has to be restarted with every deal. So, it, well, that's, so it, that's true on an agent level. And that's why we systematize. And that, that's why we bring in leverage points. Because if you can move to activities-based management, then we start to flatten those troughs. So th for me, that, that's what it's about. Like if, if I can, it, it's, you can only focus on one thing at a time, right? No one's ever caught two balls at the same time, right? So it's like, it's, it's about creating those systems behind you to allow you to fill the pipeline while, while you're doing, while you're doing the good work. Yeah. You know, maybe somebody has caught two balls at one time. Right. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you that they had to work too hard at that and it probably wasn't worth it. <laughs> no, yeah. That's, that's... You know, uh, no, I, I just, just, I had that visual, uh, you know, catching two balls at the same time. It's, that's, it's, that's it's difficult, out. right? Okay, so uh, let me let me ask you a question. Uh, you mentioned that the last thing to leverage and 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 go seek an empire builder to fill is the listing business. Yeah. So, do you go on listing appointments today? No, I, I, it's been a little over four years since I've been in a house on either side of the transaction. Wow. And I'm, it, what's, what's, I, I, I keep saying I'm going to be transparent, but so when, when someone says like that, says this, so there's a, there's a sense of ego around it. Like, wow, he's really got it figured out. But I, I want you to know that the people that are going into the homes on broker Asheville's account right now are doing a better job than I did. 
And, and that's, that's what it's about. But having the um, awareness to say, gosh, that they're really executing at a high level. So then I can move, I can pivot. And then I can start creating opportunity in other areas to allow that bubble to expand. That, that's where the beauty is. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm still blown away by what you said, Ken, Ben, on in a house either side of the deal for yep. four years. For four wow. years. So first of all, I'd say congratulations. Thank you. Very few agents uh, have achieved that distinction. Um, that that that's a that's a big deal, and I I just I want to say that you, you, I know you're going to be humble and say no 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 I know a lot of agents who've done that, and and yet it's 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 a very short list. <laughs> it's a short list um, because I've I've known a lot of agents. Very um, few people are capable of giving up that level of control, but in the end. If you want control, that's what I, yeah. You have to give it up. Now this is this is dichotomous and crazy, but it's yeah. real, right. So, tell, walk me through the steps that gave you the feeling that you had permission to give up control because you had the right people on the bus. So there was there was some so some of this was so it was accelerated and one and one of one of my one of my like opportunities for improvement and maybe you've said this to me before. <laughs> <laughs> is 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 not moving quickly enough toward opportunity is maybe staying to like over vet something and inspect it a little bit longer than I need to. And, and I, I, I'm not saying that's not right, but for me, that's an opportunity, a place that I can improve. Mm. I, my listing, replacing myself on the listing side came when I decided to take the team leader job in our office. So I was following the model, um, the Keller model about when, what those trigger points were that would allow me to move to that, the thresholds, right? And it wasn't until I, the shape of my bucket changed where I realized that it was just engineering. I just had to find the pieces. Like I was waiting for it to happen, but then I went into the do. It's like, oh, I just need to nail this, 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 and this. So number one, I need to find someone. They need to shadow me. And we did uh, I think a four month shadow every second of my day, he was with me, heard every conversation. Why did you say this? You could have said this. Why did you say that? And he was the right person. And I, and I it, it actually it was a lot of it had to do with the shape of my bucket at the time. I didn't keep taking things from him. Mm -hmm. that, that shape of the bucket analogy is so good. And, and the shape of your bucket changed. Oh, yes. So the had to move. The water. Yeah. That's right. Really good. So I love what you said about spending four months, day and night. Uh -huh. Anything you did, he went along. So what you did was you launched, and I'm, this is the listing side of it, right? Only the listing side, right? Yeah. You really launched with an intern. I, I did. I did. Um, Even if he had a different role in terms of, you know, what he was called. Oh, no, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you made him your number one priority. I, I did because he was a brick. Every minute of the day with somebody uh, and have them feel like, you know, they're, they're not number one. That's right. You're, you're right. And it's, <laughs> you, you have to slow and say why. So when, when you say something, most people are going to back up and say, wow, he's great at scripts or he handled that really well. And then you're going to skip away. And that lets you retain that eye, keep, keeps you important in the business. My gift in that relationship has been to slow down and say, I said this because this leads to this, which leads to this. And when, I, when he learned how to bake the cake, mm -hmm. he was done. Like he was good. He had it from that point on. That's, that's awesome. I, uh, I have to tell you that one of the lessons that I learned in succeeding to other people is slowing down for the hiring process, yep. following a process, stretching it out over several interviews. Yes. Starting with a screening interview. Yep. Then 
kind of each interview is a decision gate. Right. And at the, at the end of the process, you really know the good, the bad, the ugly, the fears, the doubts, the strengths, the weaknesses, the hopes, the dreams. And, and you, know, you, you know that you've got something about the person that you understand that probably no other employer has understood. That's right. But that in and of itself is never enough. <laughs> Most people stop there. They don't even follow a, a, an interview process. So if they hire the right person, they just lucked out. Most people stop there. And yet the next stretch, and this is what I learned from corporate consulting, the next stretch is what's called a 100-day action plan, yep. right? And, and it's every day you're with this person yep. all day long. So and out of what they're, they're it's, it's like ongoing. Yep. It's not you meet once a week. No. It's like, okay, I'm in your world. Now I'm going to be all up in it in terms of the control that I have mm -hmm. for the first 100 days. That's it. That's well. That's the relationship building, right? So the so we the thirty sixty ninety, which is effectively the same thing with, with executables on a weekly basis, right? So it's like the, here are the things we need to accomplish on a day to day basis to get us through the week, so we can on a month we know where our benchmarks are. And I tell people when I go into business with them, and this the reason I mention this is this is scalable and repeatable. This is a system, right? I do it every single time. Here are the expectations, and I say. Mark, I'm so excited to go into business with you. What I want to do is I want to, we're going to build our relationship on a 30 day basis. There are fundamentals that it takes to succeed at this job. And I'm going to put those fundamentals in front of you. We don't earn the right to get into the magic zone until we hit the 90th day. That's when I'm going to ask you what your magic is and how we can implement new strategies and systems. But right now I need to know that you can meet our standards as far as the activities it takes to succeed. Does that make sense? Hundred percent, right? Right. And and the, the other thing I love about that dialogue, Jeff, and um, it it speaks right to who I am, is that people really want to earn their autonomy. Yes. But people seek autonomy before they've earned the right to have autonomy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's I see that over and over again. Mm -hmm. Just leave me alone. I'll do what I need to do. <laughs> right. No, it's not like that. No. And um, I just, I just think there's just so much uh, to leverage. So now you've hired the right person. You take yeah. it up this four month, yep. like you know, every day, day in, day out. You know this person backwards and forwards. You, 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 you bonded in a really right. way. Yep. And so now it's about helping them continue to grow, mm -hmm. expand, thrive, yep. get what they want, um, and, and truthfully retain them. So, so yep. and that's a big deal too, right? You hire the right person. They're really good. You, you train them really well. They're really good. Now they might think, oh, I don't need Jeff any longer. So uh, I would like to share with you something on this. Yeah. So uh, in, in our market center, two, two of my top agents that are not in my business were buyer's agents on my business. One of which, and his name's Colin, I, I said to Colin, he was my highest performing buyer's agent, crushed it. And I, I just woke up one day and I was like, it, it, it wasn't that he couldn't be a fit for me, but I could see that he himself was ready to build his own empire. And I always, so we talk about retention as if to keep, but you can actually empower people and send them on their journey. So I literally had a baby bird in the nest conversation with him. That's beautiful. And, I, and he said, you're firing me? And I said, well, no, I'm setting you free, buddy. 
and I'm going to help you build this. And I give you that as my commitment. You'll be outside my business. And I'm going to do everything I can to help you build it. And he right now, as far as individual agents go, he's got to be my number one or number two agent in my market center. What a great story. So um, that had to take some courage. It stinks, man. It's scary when, you, when you're running a business, right? Because there's revenue that comes from these relationships. But when you know somebody, that's when we're getting back to the personal stuff. When you know somebody and you know what makes them tick and you see, you can see through what is his trajectory? How can I create that bubble around him? I, I have a commitment. Nobody will ever touch my bubble. But his, his bubble was a different shape than mine. And it wasn't, one wasn't better than the other, but I said, all right, let's, let's go help you build your own bubble. And he's got tons of people he's in business with and has a life that's very different than it was. And he credits you. We have, we spoke this morning. Yeah. Spoke this morning and we're talking about leverage. He called me and said, I want to whiteboard some leverage conversations. Yeah, that's, that's like, for me, I think that almost has more value than uh, any other aspect of this conversation. That's okay. the one where I went, oh, my heart, like, yep. just says, oh, wow, people first. Yep. You know, you almost have to see where they're going before they get there. That's a great statement. You do. Is that, that so? Yeah. Go, go, go. I was going to say it, and I don't mean to beat it to death, but when we're talking about the shape of the bucket, they, there is, I, I mentioned earlier that your, the architecture of your dreams and where your trajectory is is based off your environmental circumstances and the people that were part of your development, right? And then when we get into relationships, someone's in a business sense, and we start to learn them. I don't have a predetermined idea of where this person can go or can't go. So the biggest asset we can give to those team members is to do what, what you just said. If you can see through what they're, what they see and offer that insight, Hey, your bucket might be a little shaped a little different than you think it is. I think, I think maybe you want to look at this. Um, and maybe it's not. Your bucket is morphing, you know, yeah. that's, that's really good. Yeah. I, 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 I'm inspired by that because I, I know that um, left to, you know, kind of our own devices or left to what I would call that traditional hierarchical business logic that sucks so bad. Yeah, <laughs> terrible. Particularly in today's world, you know, you, you'd operate from a mindset of scarcity and control. Right. And really, building a business is about operating from a mindset of people first. They win on their terms. Mm -hmm. And you help them get what they want, even when it's not a part of what you're doing. That's, that, that's why we do this. And it's, it's, it's interesting, but that's we... The juice. That's the juice. It's the juice. It's, it's, that's, that's your V8. Yep. It is. That's the juice. Shake it up. That's the juice. That's great, Jeff. I love that so much. Wow. I, uh, I, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm even being inspired and learning in a, like a way that's helping me in my business. Cause you know, I'm here launching a business and, We've got, we've got quite a few email subscribers at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all about bringing them value. It's all about, you know, this, this core document stays in front of me, which is my beliefs, my values, our team's mission, vision, values, beliefs, perspectives, all of our principles. And, um, you know, we're in this building mode. And I can, I can tell you that... Um, when you get in a building mode, you can overemphasize your importance as the leader. Yeah. I've, I've, I've under, under emphasize others' contributions. So I, I kind of needed this. I, I have to tell you, I needed it. Great conversation. Um, let me ask you, because 
I know we're, we're kind of, we're getting close to our, our, our time here. Um, and, and I'd love to, to have a follow-up conversation and maybe even do a, a mastermind of some kind on leverage. I'd love to do that. Offer to a group. Maybe we could do that together, but I, I would really uh, like to hear your um, just quick um, like description of how you approach building a listing business and 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 building a dominant market share business or a, a leading market share business. So, so the, I mean, the, the tricky part about this is to to go big. We got to go small. So the, the the biggest way that we can build, uh, I mean, Gary said build a motor on your business, but the, the biggest way we can do that is through community and relationship. So what's really interesting is I think uh, maybe this is touchy ground because of the current environment, but I think Rich Barton's a blessing to this industry. I, I, I tend to agree. Boy, he's definitely a disruptor. Because what he's done is he's he he is creating a, transactional opportunity for the consumer that will ultimately enhance our value proposition. It will thin the herd. There's no question. But what, it, what, what I believe it's doing is it's, it's making us get really, really um, specific about what is our value proposition to our people. And by people, I mean the clients and the interactions that we have. How, how do I enhance that? And what, what is my value proposition? And then how do I create networks and how resources that I can move forward with that you can't click a button to get? Mm -hmm. The reason that people call me and my nickname is Broker Jeff. I mean, I helped somebody buy a car two weeks ago. He just said, I, I'm not good at buying cars and you're really good at it. So can you help me? And I spent a Saturday morning, an hour on a Saturday morning helping somebody buy a car. And that's a past client. I, you know, I, I, I uh, I've done that with my team leaders many times. Yeah. Like, yeah, let's go, let's go. Yeah, yeah. that's that, that's so good. Well, you know, again, I must say that it it starts here. Yeah. And um, I think there's there's nothing more to true growth. This is Michael Singer. But uh, he says, I got to think about this. There's nothing more important to true growth than realizing that you are not the voice of your mind. You're the one who's listening to it. You're yeah. the one who hears it. Um, and I think so many of us think that we have to be the voice of our mind rather than learn from, you know, what we're observing yeah. and, and witnessing that's going yeah. on. What it, you, you're specifically asking about a listing business, and I, I don't want to avoid that. The, so I, I do believe it's relationship based. And, and the way that that's done is through that value proposition. So what, what we focus on is, number one, how are you communicating with your database? And I hear, well, I got a ton of unsubscribes. You know, I sent out a newsletter or local happenings or something. I got a ton of unsubscribe. But if you listen longer, if you leave that line open, the second part of that conversation is I only got one or two leads out of it. So you mean by you communicating with somebody and delivering them value, they chose to enhance that relationship with you and move it into a real estate relationship. But what we hear is the, I got a ton of subscribes and that's, that's the ego part and that, and it, it hurts, right? Cause maybe I wasn't relevant, but at the end of the day, those people are in your database for a reason. Does it hurt or do you get, what can I learn from this? It's what can I learn from this, right? Yeah. How, do, how do I pivot? Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, the other thing I find is that uh, being really activity specific. So much. Um, that it's not about managing results. It's about managing activities. Oh, my gosh. You don't get me fired up about activities. So go, go run with that for a minute. Feel on activities, activities. So, act, so time in gives you time out. And this is a conversation we have with everybody and every business capacity or silo that, that I am involved with. So you literally earn your time out by literally being in. So if you do not have lead generation time, the rest of your day is lead generation time. 
Uh You do not have lead follow-up time. The rest of your day is lead follow-up time. And what that does is it creates lots of gray area, which then gets into, because I didn't dedicate an hour or two of lead generation this morning, Jackson, I will have to check my phone under the table to make sure I'm not missing a lead while you're trying to read your first book to me. So the time in is what gives you the time out. And I had, that was hard. I just wrote that down. I love that. I love that statement so much. Yeah. But by having that dedicated time in, you get out of that mess. That's right. There's no bookends. If you don't do that, you just look, it's like the beach. There's just water on the beach. Like I got to have the bookends. I got to have it because I can't, I can't not be on unless I'm off. Yeah. Right. And I can only do that. So true. So true. Yeah. Um, I, and, and, and I think that it's not being off to be off. It's being off to be doing more acti- more more activities, even often more important activities, that that really bring in more opportunity. Yeah. yeah. So there there's an there's an I part of this, and I know I'm going back to ego, but this is really important to me. When your business is not based in activities, it is not repeatable and scalable. It has to do with you and the way you do things. When you move into an activities management mindset you're actually managing the activities that give you results, very cause and effect. So if you can't repeat it, your business revolves around you, which takes away the ability to expand into different markets, takes the ability to systematize, all those things get really tricky. So by managing our activities, we are creating something that we can then replicate in another area. Uh Yeah, really, really good. Okay, so Jeff, I think that that um, is just, it's, it's, first of all, it, it's pure gold in terms of its value and importance. And um, the, the one thing I would say is that um, I would hope that, you know, our listeners don't overcomplicate this. No. <laughs> because um, complexity comes from overthinking. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, master the basics. It's, so simple, not easy. Just, just, just stay with the basics, and don't go chase shiny objects. Mm-hmm. Time block for the activities, and get that time out as a result of time blocking. It's just, it's just a great message, and it's powerful, and and I, I think so, so valuable and meaningful to the people that that are listening to us. So. Um, I want to. I want to kind of wrap this up because I think we spent, you know, over an hour together, and <laughs> I, I could keep going. You know, this like I could take a break and say, okay, let's go next because this is just such great material. It's so good, and uh, I just want to say thank you for sharing. And uh, let's uh, let's reconnect soon and do something um, again that uh, that inspires us both. Uh, and, and and can help people. Um, I, love, I, I love your I love your brain. I, I, I admire the way you think so much, and uh, I just want to say thank you. In a big in a big, it's the Willis Willis leadership and the what you bring to the table. I'm, I honestly I, I feel lucky to be in conversation with you. So it's wow. that's not a, like a, a plug at all. That's unwarranted. Like you're so genuine. And I feel like you have so much to give that I'm proud to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Jeff. You're a one in a million. And uh, this is, this has been a blast for me. This has just been fun. Been fun. Me fun. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. All right. Let's sign off. Thanks right. again. Great information. Appreciate you. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Bye.